All right, so those are the three granting clauses, or four of them. All right, so let's go back to where we're at because I want to finish. The next clause is called the Habendum Clause. The Habendum Clause is the cousin to who? Santa Claus. You guys should have caught that one. That was real obvious. The Habendum Clause gives you the degree of ownership to have and to hold. Sound familiar? Told you it's in the marriage, your marriage contract, to have and to hold. That's the Habendum Clause. We have it in here. It, it explains the degree that we get to enjoy the property. Remember, possession's one of our rights. It's granted through the Habendum Clause. I have the right to have the property and to hold it, i.e. possess the property. Then the legal description would go in here, and here's where the Northwest Quadrant of the Northwest Quadrant of the North, all that stuff we just learned, that would go in there. Then there would be any exceptions or reservations like builders, the CCR we talked about, the easements, or the builder says, I want you to build a 5,000 square foot house. That would all be in this deed so that when we transfer, the new owner would know that they were supposed to build a certain specific house. Then you would have the signing of it. The seller or the grantor would sign the deed to transfer it. And then at... <clears throat> Then you get at what's called acknowledged. Acknowledgement is nothing more than a formal declaration under oath that the person signing it is in fact who they say they are. What's the common term for this? Notarized. notarized. We get it notarized. If you've ever been in a closing before, you walk in, the first thing they ask for, can I need your ID? because they're a notary that's doing the closing and they want to make sure that Raymond Modulin is in fact the guy standing before them and he will watch me sign all of the documents, then they will acknowledge it, i.e. notarize it, to, to validate that it was Raymond that signed. Acknowledgement or notarizing has nothing to do with the legal document. They are not attorneys, not practicing law. I can write down pink elephants fly at midnight and get it notarized. All a notary is doing is saying, I want to see the proof that that's Raymond. Here's my ID. Yes, that's Raymond. I want to watch you sign it. Sign it. He signed it. Then I notarize that, yes, Raymond signed that stupid statement. But a notary will never go, that's not legal. It has nothing to do with the validity of the document. It just states that, that it was, in fact, Raymond that signed it, and I verified that, and I'm a notary, register number so-and-so. Yes, that was Raymond that signed it. Okay? So now, we go to the closing, walk in, the person that closes it takes her ID, we do this, we sign all the documents. When does the property transfer and take ownership? When does the boop happen? We have an answer called, when you sign the deed, we have one that says, when it's filed. Neither one of those are correct. At closing. That's pretty generic. Once you're giving it away, if there's no money. Deed is delivered and accepted by the buyer. When the deed is delivered and accepted by the buyer, property transfers. So when you're sitting in the closing and you're a buyer, and the lady comes back and makes all the copies, you've signed everything, and she says, I'll be right back, and she comes back with the copies, and she reaches out with a packet of documents. One of the documents is the deed, and she says, congratulations on your purchase, and you reach up and take that packet, boom, property transferred. It's now yours. It's delivered and accepted. If you say, I'm not accepting that, property's never transferred. And I've been in several cases before where the seller has signed their closing documents, the buyer didn't make it in, until the buyer comes in and signs and accepts that deed, even though the sellers have signed, it's still the seller's house. We had one a number of years ago. This is so perfect, you guys won't believe me. Almost unbelievable. Sellers went in at 9 a.m., 
signed all the documents. Our buyers were due at 3 p.m. because he got off work. 12.05, the house got hit by lightning and burned to the ground. Still the seller's home because the buyers never accepted the deed. Might have been signed, but it was never delivered. Title company calls me about 1.30 and goes, hey, got a problem. Not closing today. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And like every other agent in the world, I'd already spent this commission. <laughs> I got a car payment due. <laughs> They're like, I'm like, uh, can we close tomorrow? <laughs> the guy starts laughing and goes, I doubt it. He goes, the house burnt to the ground. I'm like, what? He's like, yep. Yeah. The fire department just called us. Owners just called us. Got hit by lightning. And the actual other agent called us and said, hey, our sellers are still willing to go ahead with the deal and we'll subrogate the commission check or the insurance check to you guys. You guys can build a bigger house with the insurance. And of course, the lender's like, no, we're not, we're not ponying up money for a half burnt house. So we actually had to go out and buy another house. So it's delivered and accepted is when the boop happens. So theoretically, the buyer walks out of closing as the owner of the house. As soon as they walk out the door, they own the house because they've received the deed. has to be delivered and accepted. All right? <clears throat> now, there's a couple other deeds that we've gone through, and there on the overhead you can see there's the general, has five guarantees, then the special. So when they say warranty deed, they mean general, or they'll say special warranty deed if it's a special warranty deed. All right? So if you hear somebody just say warranty deed, they mean general warranty deed. Or they'll say convey property through a special warranty deed. Bargain and sale, quick claim, there's one other called a deed of trust. Remember when a guy trust deeds property into a trust and we talked about him being the trustor? The deed he would use to give it to that trust is called a deed of trust a deed of trust. Remember? Guy gives the property to the trust, and I said a trust is one way to own property. We talked about severalty, co-ownership, and trust was the third way. How it gets into that trust? The trustor would deed the property into the trust, and he would be the grantor, the trust would be the grantee, the trustee would accept it for the trust, the property is deeded into a trust, that special deed is called a deed of trust. All right? Now, if the property has to go back to the trustor for some reason, remember that I told you the trustor had the reconveyance or the reversionary interest? They would use a reconveyance deed to go back to the trustor. The trustee would deed the property back to the original guy that wrote it through what's called a reconveyance deed. It's the only time that deed's ever used, is in a reconveyance. What's that mean? Re, back, conveys, transfer. Transfer back to the original owner, he would have a reconveyance deed. If the trustee deeds property to anybody else in the world, anybody, since the trustee is the one signing that, it's called a trustee's deed. It's called a trustee's deed. All right? So in my trusts, if my trustee deeds the property to my kids as joint tenants with right of survivorship, he would, they would get a trustee's deed because Joe would sign that trustee's deed as the trustee of my trust. I trust you understand that. All right? Now, there's one last deed I want to talk about. <clears throat> Occasionally, someone dies, they appoint an executor, they got to sell the property. There is a special deed. It's called a deed executed pursuant versus the sale of the property. The only way you know this deed exists I told you that generic statement says for $10 and other good and valuable services, 
It's in everybody's deed. It's a generic term. It's already pre-printed. We don't have to write it. In a deed issued by the court or forced by the court, they will actually put the real number in there so that the judge knows how much the house sold for. So it would say something to the order of $175,000 and other good and valuable services. That way, when it gets recorded, the judge then knows how much to divvy out amongst all the survivors or all the people of the will, all right? Everybody get what I'm saying? So if you see a deed on it that says for $412,000 and other good and valuable services, that was a deed issued pursuant to a court order. Probably means someone died, they put it into a, uh, an estate, and they sold the estate through an estate house. And what they don't want is some executor selling the house for cash and going back to the judge and go, hey, we sold it for 10 bucks, divide this amongst the... No, we want the deed to say the exact number. That way the judge, when it gets recorded, can see, hey, you better have $412,000 to divide amongst all the people. All right? So if it's a deed executed pursuant to a court order, it will have the real number in there and not the generic $10, right? Now, my only question is, is once if he sells it for $10? <laughs> I guess I'm the only one that thinks that's weird. All right. So what you have is all these deeds, general warranty deed, special warranty deed, bargain and sale deed, quit claim deed. Deed of trust, trustee's deed, deed executed pursuant to a court, court order. These are all the mechanisms that transfer the title from the grantor to the grantee, either through a sale, through a gift, and we're going to find another one here. That, this is the little boop between the two. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about one other thing that the book likes to talk about that the state of Indiana doesn't like to talk about, except on the exam. <laughs> it's called the transfer tax. The transfer tax. In some states, Florida is one of them, when you sell property, there is a tax on that property that the seller has to pay just like you could equate it to like a sales tax kind of thing. It's typically paid by the seller. They can negotiate it, all kinds of things, all right? That tax is based on what they call packets, a packet. And let me give you the best example. I love the car analogy for a different reason, Holly, not this one. Let me ask you a question. If you, and here's how the packet system works. If I've got six people that need to go somewhere, and I've got a car that only ha handles four people, no crowding in, no in the trunk, only handles four, and I'm transferring six people, how many cars do I need? Two. Two. Why not one and a half? Because you can't have half a car. You cannot have partial packets. Okay? You've got to have full packets. So let me give you an example. The best one is, and one of them may say for every $500 packet, you have to pay 50 cents in taxes. So if I sold the house for $500 and my taxes are 50 cents for every $500, how many packets do I have? How many packets of 500 fit in $500 sale? It's not a trick question. One, I would pay 50 cents in taxes. Everybody see that? Now, suppose I sold the property for $501. How many packets do I have now? Got to have the full packet, just like I have to have the full car. So if I sell the house from $501 up to, well, I could even up to 1,000, right? That's still two packets. <coughs> there are no partial packets allowed. You can't say 1.8 times 50, no. One packet, 
Now I need two. So I would pay a dollar in tax, two times 50 cents, because each packet of $500 is 50 cents. I've got two packets, I pay a dollar in tax. Right? Sweet. Everybody get your calculator out. I sold the house for $178,000. I'm going to change that for 78 threes. $178,300. The tax is a dollar and a quarter for every $500. I pay a dollar and a quarter tax for a packet. How much is my transfer tax on this property? Absolutely not. I don't even know the answer. I can almost guarantee that. Well, no, I take that back. I'm sorry, I take that back, Holly, you might be right. Because the uh, quarters could add, add up to a 75 cents. So, did you get what you had? Okay, I'm sorry, you were right. I was thinking whole, whole dollars. I was, I originally did this with dollars in my head. I would do it the other way around. <laughs> take 178,300 divided by 500. <coughs> No, because if you get a, if that's what you did, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that answer is probably not right then, because you, that'll give you a fraction, and you can't have fractions. You, once you get an answer, you got to round up. You didn't do it as one time. How many times, just do this. Oh, hold on. Let's not argue, let's just do it. Take 178,300 and divide it by 500. What do you get? Just that number. What? 356.6, right? You can't have that number because you got 0.6 packets. That's what I'm saying. That you, you can't do it the way you just did it is one math problem because it gave you a decimal and then you multiplied the decimal by that because that's actually 357 packets. So I was right that you were wrong. <laughs> but I'm not one to gloat. So it turns out to be 356.6 packets, but I cannot have a partial packet. It would be very analogous to said, I needed 356.6 cars to transfer people. Can't have 0.6 of a car, so I got to bring the full next one in to use it. So I literally have... 357 packets of $500. Multiply that by $1.25. Now what do you get? 446 what? 25. That's how much the transfer tax would be on that property. Guarantee you one question on that, at least one. But you cannot do the math the way that Tiffany did it because it comes out with a fraction. You have to do how many packets and look at it, and you may have to round up because you can't have that 0.6 partial. Okay?